Hi, and thanks for clicking. This is my second Vars Vlog 2018. If you've not checked out the first one, feel free to. It's really quite a simple concept, which suits me very well. I choose a new image each month from a Greek vase and talk about it. This time, I've selected a scene on a vase known as a hydria, and these were primarily used to store or carry water. The particular hydria is 34 centimetres high, or just a bit over, so it may have functioned in a practical context, though I sense it would have been treated as a bit of a luxury item and probably existed as the good china, or the sort of fancy plates you might now have when guests are invited round. The image itself is known as red figure, and you can see why. Red figure was a technique which came into use around the end of the 6th century BC. Prior to this, vase images had been black figure. It gave the artists a new way of dealing with subjects and themes. Red figure is thought of as an Athenian development, so it's little surprise that this hydra has Attica as its home. In terms of dating, this piece is thought to have been made around 460 BC. Yet the hydra wasn't found in Attica. As with the first vase we looked at, we need to travel to the Italian peninsula, but this time we travel south of Rome and to Capua. This city was very influential and powerful. In sa it sat in what we know as Magna Graecia, the southern part of Italy, dominated by Greek culture and Greek colonies. It's thought that Capua was actually founded by the Etruscans, but as we saw in the first vase vlog, they were also big fans of Attic pottery, so it's little surprise that we find it here as well. Sadly, I couldn't find an exact date to when the Hydra arrived in Capua, but it's a good reminder that Greek art existed outside the, outside the mainland, and you can also understand how Greek culture must have influenced the nascent and expanding Roman civilization. Now that we're done with the whys and the wheres, we can look at the image itself, in which we witness Perseus escaping with a Medusa's head in a bag under his arm. For folk of a certain age, any mention of Medusa will bring about memories of the 1981 film, Clash of the Titans, which featured Laurence Olivier, Maggie Smith, Ursula Andres, and Penguin from the Batman TV show. As a kid watching this, I was terrified by Medusa, and even a recent Ray Harryhausen exhibition reminded me that the childhood fears I had haven't really ventured that far. The artist responsible is known as the Pan Painter. He or she is acknowledged as taking aspects of the older styles, more often associated with the black figure pottery style, and using them to inform their work. The pan painter is also referred to as a mannerist. Back to Medusa. She wears a cheat on and though it's plain, there has been strong attention paid to it in the folds of the hem. The wings are beautiful. If a less capable artist had tried to handle this, they may have found them cluttering up the space. The wings don't have impact on the other characters and offer depth as Athena's spear passes behind it. The cheat on is perhaps left blank at the top to allow, well, a spurt of blood from her neck stump more prominence. A bit macabre. The importance of the wings is more so when you realise that Medusa is denied what is her defining feature, her face. Without the wings, we might not as easily understand this is a gorgon. I'm sure we'd eventually identify her. But these remind us that we're not dealing with a regular mortal. To the right of Medusa, we can see Athena carrying a spear and picking up the hem of her skirt as she treads carefully. I find this part of the image particularly interesting for several reasons. The skirt itself isn't a single block of fabric. It too has depth. Note how the outline of the leg closest to us can be made out whilst the one behind is hidden. The effect is of a slightly translucent material, which is quite a feat to represent. A light, breezy skirt being picked up up at the hem. Is this the type of attire we'd associate with Athena? I'll go into this a bit more later but for now we can more easily recognise the upper half of the figure as far more reminiscent of Athena. Though of course she doesn't have the Gorgon's head on her aegis just yet as it's still in Perseus's bag. The final figure we are left with is Perseus. The lack of a beard indicates his youth. His arms extend outwards in a mannerist style and his stance is similar to that of Athena's which give the scene balance and makes Medusa's awkward poise that bit more obvious. In his left hand he carries a sickle or knife he used and in the bag is the head. Perseus is offered to us with the expected outfit. He wears the helmet and sandals whilst carrying the bag and the knife. The scene is one many might be familiar with, but like many vase images, you can be rewarded for taking some time to look a bit closer. Is what we are witnessing really the heroic defeat of a monster? Consider the poses of both Perseus and Athena, one prancing and the other one at tiptoe. There's little about Perseus which establish him, him as a hero in real mortal danger, in fact quite the opposite. Our hero has managed to behead a sleeping gorgon. It's far from wrestling lions or 
besting an armed opponent in combat. Portraying a hero in the less than heroic fashion is inconsistent, even ironic. Take Athena. Here is the goddess of war, yet she daintily picks her way past a corpse, holding up the hem of her skirt, perhaps fearful of getting it dirty. Athena could almost be two separate entities. Her lower half is of a maid stood in a stool, scared of a mouse, but the upper half is of a warrior with a helmet and spear in hand. It's a visual contradiction. Given the painter's ability, I think this was deliberate. It can't have just been an accident. The contradictions continue when we evaluate Medusa, who is more of a victim of the situation than an aggressor. Her body writhes and bleeds, but the head is at peace. The danger of a creature whose gaze was lethal except when asleep. Surely a hero would defeat Medusa when she was awake. Catherine Topper wrote an article in Hesperia titled Perseus the Maiden in the Imagery of Abduction. I'll put a link to it in the comments section in case you're interested. It's certainly worth reading. Topper made a number of very interesting and convincing points concerning the depictions of Gorgons. Amongst these was one concerning the inversion of what Topper referred to as the erotic pursuit. You may be well familiar with this sort of scene, where one character pursues another at the behest of their libido. Normally it's a satyr chasing a nymph or a god chasing a mortal. Topper argues that there was a parody version of this scene where roles are inverted for comic effect. For example, on other vases we have beautiful gorgons chasing a helpless Perseus. Of course here there is no chase, Medusa is dead. But Perseus adopts the pose of someone being pursued. If we assume that the parody of Perseus was a well-known theme or motif, might this be a nod to it? If the underlying aim of this image is to supply a tongue-in-cheek and humorous version of the myth, then we might find the inconsistencies and, con and contradictions, as mentioned earlier, as the sly nods or winks that fun was being had. Even today, role reversal, or simply subverting the expected norm, is a common technique used in comedy. Place the hero in the style of a maid or nymph being chased by a randy satyr. Have the goddess of war worried about getting blood on her skirt. These absurdities invite a humorous response. Finally, have the heroic act of defeating a monster reframed as one which involves, well, beheading a sleeping woman. We know satire plays of the classical period often parodied famous myths, using role reversal and subverting norms, and Aristophanes certainly used the, these techniques later. There's no reason this humour couldn't extend to other forms of art, and perhaps here we have as good an example as any. If we agree that the scene hosts a comic tone, and I do, then it's wonderfully observed. The characters operate counter to our expectations, and the pan painter is toying with the genre of the heroic quest, while still ensuring that technique and form aren't lost as a result. The placement of the scene on the shoulder of the hydria allows the curve of the vase to drive the action, giving it dynamism. Of course, we can't be sure how it is received. It might have been an in-joke at the time, an image which rewarded the attentive viewer with a comic version of a scene, while still preserving enough of the standard format to initially hide the second reading, a sort of, and I'm going to show, show my age here a bit, a sort of magic eye. If so, it's a wonderful example of a piece referring or referencing the wider world and other art forms.